Bob has been very generous in, my, in, in introducing me. I'm really, after that wonderful introduction, Bob, I'm dying to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be back in Waterloo after, I suspect, some 30 years. 30 years ago, University of Waterloo was somewhat different than what I remember, or it's quite possible in my old age I'm forgetting things what have looked like what I thought was 30 years ago. During the next 50 minutes, what I would like to do is to puncture some myths. I'm not saying I'm right. As an academic, I think I have the right to say what I think is correct and why I think I'm right. I would also take issue with many of the current paradigms in the water field. I'll question many of the data which are you, which, are, which have been used so many, many times. I heard this morning as well in the seminar. And why I don't think those type of information or data is not even worth the paper on which it is written on. No. First, water crisis. The world believes we have a major crisis coming in the area of water. That many of you must have seen the standard bank, uh, standard maps made up by the United Nations, World Bank, World Water Council, you name it. Bloomberg, week before last, published it again, which basically shows water stress in the countries. And everybody uses the map, so much so nobody thinks about it anymore. And like Goebel's statement that if you lie often enough, the lie becomes the truth. What do you mean by water stress? What do we mean by water crisis? CV, uh, CNBC did a program on water crisis, of a one-hour program, and the, the way they advertised it was, what do you do when you don't have any, enough water? Well, if you don't have water, it's all gone, we are dead. But is that a reality? I would like to say water crisis has become a growth industry. If you go and Google water crisis, unless you have done it very recently, I doubt very much you'll know how many references to water crisis you'll get in the Google. Just, put, just Google water crisis. 153 million items. Go back, go forward two months' time, take a look, you'll find few million more. So it's a growth industry. Everybody wants to talk about the water crisis. Media wants to talk about the water crisis. Everybody, when I go and advise somebody, they say, haven't you heard the UN says there's a water crisis, go, water, there's going to be a water crisis within the next 10 years? I said, well, I've heard, but that's all the biggest bunch of rubbish I've heard for a long time. To 
to the question, if the world is facing a water crisis, my answer is very simple. We are not facing a water crisis, but we are facing a crisis in water management. Two are very different. I can take a back of the envelope, no matter which country you want to identify, and I can show you with the modern, not with modern, with the current technology or technology available for the last 10 years at least, investment funds that are already available. No country in the world, if you manage your water carefully, should be facing water crisis. Now you might ask, well that's fine now with seven, slightly over 7 billion people in this earth. What happens in 2050? when you expect 9.3 billion people in this earth, how are you going to provide enough water for drinking, enough water for industry, enough water for their food, energy? Would there be enough water available? I would argue not only enough water available, if we use existing knowledge, we can probably support without any difficulty about 10 to 12 billion people with food, energy, whatever they need. But you would need good management, which is missing. There are very few countries that are managing water properly, including Canada. Can water management in Canada, I have to tell you, is atrocious. I'm a scientist. I say things as I see it. If you don't agree with me, I'm willing to argue with you with facts and figures. But it, this doesn't mean that if you, if you tell me what you are talking, Professor Biswas is a bunch of baloney, I don't take exception to that because we will be arguing about facts, figures, and interpretation. That doesn't mean you don't like me or I don't like you, but it is just a question, it's just the views differ. Now, take, if you're talking about the water, which part of the world is most water stressed? Probably as a region, Middle East and North Africa, okay? So you would think Middle East and North Africa will have some water problems now or in the future. Well, if water management in Canada is bad, water management in the Middle East is absolutely dismal. If I ask you which country in the world uses more water per person, Part day, the top ones are all in the Middle East. The world's largest user of water per person per day, and I have the foggiest idea how they're using that water, is Qatar, Doha. Water use per person per day is 500 liters per person per day. If I take a citizen of Hamburg, Hamburg is not in the desert. It rains quite a lot in Europe and including Germany. Average water use in Hamburg is 100 liters per capita per day. So why is it in Doha people are using five times as much water. You go to Riyadh, the same, very close to four to 500 liters. You go to Kuwait, very, very similar, extremely high use. And last year, the Kuwait Minister of Water Resources came to Singapore 
and gave a talk in the Singapore International Water Week. And he said, we have a big problem. We don't have enough water. And I said, you don't have enough water? OK. How much water do you use? They start scratching their head. I said, how much water do you lose from your system? Because in the Middle East, roughly, Middle East, and it's common in the developing world, between 40 to 60 percent of the water of any municipality never reach the consumer. And it really doesn't matter if it's a new one, new system, or if it's an old system. I don't know how things are constructed, but the fact remains, even in a brand new water supply system, losses are now running at between 32 to 35 percent. Nobody talks about it. World's largest user of water is agriculture, right? Of course, we have no idea what percentage of water agriculture goes. You see, in the international community, we have a one very interesting way of doing things. We don't know how much water India uses for agriculture. We haven't a clue how much water China uses for agriculture. But if we bundle them all together, put it as a global use, nobody questions it. And to give you an example, Canada got out recently UN desertification convention. Well, when I was the advisor to the executive director of UNEP for 18 years, scientific advisor. He said, Osit, you help me to find out what magnitude of land is desertified. So you had the best university, best group in Holland to give us and prepare an estimate what is the desertified area in the world. The group prepared to the best of their knowledge, country by country. They started with Angola, Australia, and went back to Zambia and Zimbabwe, the Yemen, the whole list, country by country. This is a country, this is our estimate, and this is the total. So we had 20 of the world's biggest, ex best experts on desertification. Look at the table. All of them said, the Americans said, well, you have the figure for the US. No way, Jose, we are going to accept that. It's incorrect. The Russians said, we don't know where you got the information from. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, at least we can't talk about the other countries. For Russia, it doesn't work. We went through every country, nothing happened. Everybody said the same. Your estimates, either we think is either too high or too low. We don't know how much land in our country is, is uh, being desertified, but it's either too high or too low. Now what happened? After a great deal of discussion, it, a number had to be produced. A number had to be produced by the UN, for the UN. He said, only way we could do that, if we give it country by country, everybody will question the data, okay? So if you're a Canadian and they say, and Canada has cold desert, it's a very interesting way of defining desert. So Canada has cold desert, the others are dry deserts. So the Canadians can say, this number we don't think is correct. So the credibility of the number disappears. So what was finally done at the end of the meeting, we said, the only way we can give a number to the UN to use, let's delete all the country uh, numbers. Let's get only a global number. Nobody can question that because you don't know how that number came. It's a very large number. And that's what, if you look at the amount of land that is desertified 
I can tell you that's not worth the paper it is written on because we don't know what are the numbers by individual countries. This morning we heard in the meeting, uh, in the, the symposium, we were told 800, uh, no, 1 billion people do not have access to safe water. 1 billion people. Large number. I have no idea. I can figure out how many people are here, but when you say 1 billion, all I know is it's a very large number. I haven't a clue what 1 billion people looks like. I've never seen 1 billion people anywhere. So it's a large number. So UN now says the latest figure for the UN is 876 million people do not have access to safe water. Fine. Then you go through the report. Perhaps in page 76 or might be 86, you'll find a footnote. Footnote will say, we are talking about not safe water, not water that is safe to drink, not clean water, water that is clean you can drink without anything. We are talking about improved sources of water. Now what is improved sources of water? We leave it to the country to decide. If you're an Indian bureaucrat and you're responsible saying how many Indians are getting clean water or the improved sources of water, you decide the definitions improved, okay? The guy from Mexico, the Mexican bureaucrat will have his or her own definition what's an improved source of water. But the fact is, and this is the common fallacy, improved sources of water has no relation to quality of water. That is clear. They'll make it clear it has no relation to clear. Well, if you don't talk about quality of water, in the report, consistently they talk about safe water, clean water. How is it? It could be safe to drink. They talk about 1 billion people, 876 million people do not have access to safe water. Okay? I can tell you, if you look at South Asia alone, South Asia alone, South Asia's population is 1.76 billion people. I challenge any one of you to show me one place in South Asia where I can drink water without worrying. One place in South Asia. And that's 1.76 billion people. I add that to Africa, Latin America, easily, easily, at least two and a half billion people do not have access to safe water. So when you see these numbers, these mega numbers, please be careful because those are deathly numbers. What difference has it made? What difference does it make whether 20 years ago you didn't have access to safe water, 20 years down the line, Vast, significant number of people do not have access to safe water. If you look in many, many countries, water is becoming, water management is so bad. Some of the large Indian cities now, like Mysore, is providing water every alternate day until the monsoon rain comes. And if you look at the statistics, you will see in Indian urban context, water supply is quite good. If you look at the statistics for Egypt, 99% of Egyptians, according to the government statistics and repeated by WHO, 99% of the people have access to safe water. I don't know a single person in Egypt and I've been advising the minister since 1974, and the current one is probably my ninth minister. I'll take you to part of Cairo where people do not know where the water is going to come from. People are waiting. This staff may work today. 
the other tap might work another day. So through the bush telegraph, they know where the water is coming, they go to collect the water. And we claim they all have almost 99% water availability. The question then you ask is, is it true cities like Cairo, cities like Delhi, cities like Chennai, Dhaka, Jakarta, do they have enough water to give their people 24-hour clean water supply? I talked to the Indian minister, Prime Minister. He told me, we cannot provide everybody in Delhi 24-hour clean water because there's not enough water. That's what his people said. I said, Prime Minister, with due respect to you, I think the first thing you should do is to fire all your water advisors. Because in Delhi, an average Delhi wala uses more water than a Canadian person. Average Canadian water consumption per person. In Canada, you have water 24 hours a day. In Delhi, if you are lucky, if you are in a very rich area, you might get three hours water supply a day. Now, the utilities may provide you water for three hours. And the reason nobody complains very much is because Indians and the Egyptians and the Mexicans, we have learned how to cope with this bad management. In, in our house, we have 24 hours water supply. Doesn't matter whether you're in India, you're in Bangladesh, you're in Egypt. So when the water comes for two hours in the morning, you have your own storage tank, you fill up the storage tank. Then you install a pumping system to pump that water to the overhead tank. So you become yourself a mini utility. So once water goes to that overhead tank, it comes to your house or your apartment, and then you make a deal, not a deal, a contract with a private sector company because you can't drink that water. So you make a contract with a private sector company to provide you with a simple carbon filter so that at least you clean your water to some extent. And that's the water people drink. If you, the problem is, theoretically, people in the developing countries are getting, most, in most of the cities, are getting free or subsidized water. But in reality, they're paying through the nose. If you include the cost of the installing two tanks, if installing the capital cost of installing a pump, electricity cost to pump umpteen times water from your underground to over a tank. If you include the cost of cleaning the two tanks, you should clean it every month, but even if you, even if you assume you clean once every three, three months, at least we can do a calculation. You are paying, if a central system would provide you water, 24 hours a day, clean water, you'll save about 35% having a central system. Nobody talks about that. The water management in China, equally bad. I do not know a single fellow in Beijing or Shanghai or family, and I've been advising Chinese government since 1983, who has the courage to drink water from the tap. In Bangkok, 76% of the household would not even cook with the tap water. They cook with the bottled water. That much they think of their city supply. And yet, 
problems are solvable. And I'm talking about, I don't want to give, leave with a depressed message. If I tell you, city of Phnom Penh in Cambodia has better water performance indicator than Toronto, Los Angeles, Chicago, London, or Paris, everybody says, you must be crazy. How can Cambodia, which is, I think, 179th country in the list of Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, bad in everything, could have that. In 1993, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority used to lose 73% of its water, 73%. That means almost every four units you put in, three units got lost because of the leaky pipes and everything. It was, for all practical purposes, bankrupt. Then Hun Sen, the premier, had, I don't know how he, why he selected, I never found out, I've never been able to find out. He brought in a veterinary surgeon to run Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority. Veterinary surgeon, knows nothing about water, knew nothing about water, of course, if you're a veterinary surgeon, you will know about the cows and the donkeys and what have you, but he would know very much about water. But the man was clever, intelligent, dedicated, he wanted to do something. So first year, he studied what was going on. He talked with various people, talked with many, many experts, what to do. Within 18 months, he developed a strategy, very simple strategy. There's no money from the municipality. If you're waiting for the municipality, it is broke, you won't get any money. So he said, only way we can provide a good water service, the user must pay for it. If you are poor, we'll design a tariff system so that you can afford to pay for the water. Number two, every house will have a metered connection. So you'll get a transparent bill every month promptly how much water you consume, so you can compare. If you think you are paying too, if you're using too much water, you, could, you can adjust how much you want to pay, but you, you have a, every house has a meter connection. Now, at that time when he started in, 19, when he started all this in 1994, he had no idea who are, who are his customers, how many customers he has. So he spent three years going from house to house, apartment to apartment, trying to find out, are you getting water? One of the most surprising thing of his finding, he found about 27% of the household who are paying the water bill do not have a connection. And I, when I first saw that, I said, this is crazy. Why would I pay for the bill if I don't have any connection? So he explained to me, in Cambodia, or Phnom Penh, I can't speak of Cambodia, I, I don't know Cambodia as a whole very much, I don't know Phnom Penh. In Phnom Penh, if you want to do anything with anything, if you want to have a telephone line, if you want to have a bank account, uh, if you want to have anything to do with the government, you must have a certificate, you must have a bill from a water agency or electricity agency you have to produce it. I have to do it in Mexico, for example. If I have to go to Mexico to do anything, open a bank account, I must produce two bills, two bills, to show I actually, and in my name, or in my wife's name, to show that I actually live in that place, that place is mine, and I'm not asking, you to, asking them to put a connection in a place, and I will disappear without paying paying the bills. So Phnom Penh is the same. If you want to open a bank account, you must produce an electricity bill and a water bill. So even if you're not getting water, 
minor amount you are paying, it's worth having that so that you can do the other official transactions because you can prove with this, you, you live in this place and that, is your, that place is yours. Okay. So he started doing an information system. I can tell you now, the inform water information system in Phnom Penh is so good, so transparent, I, I'm quite sure, I don't know about Waterloo, but if from a university you ask the group that supplies you water for data, probably Waterloo will take more time to give you that data than if whoever goes to the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority. When I went to study it, he said, when do you need the information? I said, how soon can you provide it? Because I thought he will take some time, I'm not going to stay very long. He said, will this afternoon do? I thought, he, initially I thought he must be joking. In the afternoon, one of his staff came, sir, here is all the data you want. And all the data is up to date till yesterday. Because their information system is so good, they know, if you want to know how much money they received yesterday, they immediately punch a few, you get that number. If you want to know what is their estimated income for the month, for the year, you have that. And what is also interesting is their bill collection ratio. That means you, they send out the bill. What percentage of bill gets paid, let's say, within a month? Again, when I saw that, I was surprised and some alarm bell started ringing in my head. The bill collection ratio was 102%. That means they said 100%, the, if all the bill 100%, they're getting 102% back. And I said, this sounds fishy to me. So I said, Ek, how is it possible you are getting 102%? He said, very simple. We have started a new system for the last couple of years. We know how much you're spending each month. But if you decide to pay one month in advance, I give you a 3% discount. So many of the consumers are paying in advance to get a discount. So that's why they're getting 102% return. Yes? Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority is the one authority that doesn't get a single cent from the municipality. The consumers pay everything, everything. In addition, because it is an autonomous corporation, it makes profit because they have to have money for investment. They pay taxes on the profit each month, each year. And the amount they pay taxes, if you look at this, are also going up. As the profit is going up, the taxes are going up exponentially as well. How did Exxon Chan manage to do that? Well, he said, the only way you can do that is first see who are your major water consumer. The poor pay, there's no question about that. We have found out everywhere. Poor people, they're grateful for what they get. They pay their bills promptly. Be it electricity, be it water, they pay it promptly because they think it will be cut off and we are in trouble. It's the rich and the powerful who do not pay. And in Phnom Penh, the two biggest users was the army and the government. Army never paid its water bill in its entire history. That all the government departments, school, etc., never paid a single cent in entire history. And he said, if the government doesn't pay, if army doesn't pay, there's not a hope in hell I can run this water authority. So he said, the biggest user was army. How do I get the army to pay? So he sent a note to the army saying that, if you don't pay, we'll cut off your water. In Cambodia, army generals are very powerful. They can do basically what they want. Nobody is going to stop them. Army even didn't bother to respond. He sent two reminders. Army's response was, you've got to be joking. Then he sent his men to cut off, one of his men to cut off the water. 
And when the general of the army cantonment came, found out what was the commotion about, one of his, one of his staff said, sir, PPWSS is cutting off the water to our cantonment. General was mad. So he went to see the fellow, put a gun on his head. He said, if you close that valve, you're going to be history. And he put his gun on his head. So the poor fellow went back and said to Exxon Chan, sir, I have a family, blah, blah, blah. If I die, my wife and children will be destitute. Uh, excuse me, but I don't want to die. Then Exxon Chan said, next two weeks were his most difficult period. He realized if he can't handle the army, there's not a hope in hell. You'll get a functional water authority. So he told me, he's a smart fellow, but he's a very religious man. He said, prayed for Buddha, to Lord Buddha for guidance, uh, did a lot of thinking, but he didn't rely only on Lord Buddha's blessing. Being a smart man, what he did is he, de he decided that he has to go and do it himself. So the day he went, he told his family goodbye. He said, I don't know whether I'm coming back. If I'm dead, look out. This, this, here is the, all our property, etc. Explain to his wife. But he thought he would take an insurance policy. And his insurance policy was to call all the national and the international correspondents saying that this is what's happening. Chances are the general will shoot me, but at least you'll have it in your newspaper tomorrow how I died in order to get money from the army. Sure enough, when again the general found out, he came, put a gun on his head. You close it, you're going to be history. And when his gun was on the head, all the correspondent from New York Times, local newspaper, etc., started click, 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 taking picture. And the general, who is very, generals are very powerful. If he kills, if he shoots him, nothing will happen to him. Nothing. General thought, maybe I should be a little more careful. With so many, especially foreign newspapers, taking pictures, it may somehow may backfire. So he put his gun in his holster, went back. Next day, he had his check. And the newspaper started writing about this story. That he went and this happened, it became very famous. He became a very famous person that he took on the army and all. Hun Sen, the premier, heard. He went on the television the next day. He said, no. He was very surprised to hear army was not paying, but he's glad army is from paying. He pays his water bill. All his minister must be paying his water bill. The government must pay its water bill. Everybody must pay its water bill. Now, last year, Cambodia started a stock exchange. It didn't have a stock exchange, so the World Bank helped them to make a stock exchange. The first one to be floated on the stock exchange was Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority. 10% of its stock was floated in the stock exchange. First day of issue, with no culture of stocks in the country, it popped up 49%. Now, I ask you, Phnom Penh is a place where there's no private sector. If he outsource anything to the private sector, it costs him more, it will cost him more, get a lousy service. So he, the PPWSA has to do everything itself. And within a 10 year period, the losses were brought down from about 73% to about 18%. Right now, the losses from the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority is running about 55 to 
which is better than Toronto. Any city in Canada or US you want to talk about. It's a public sector corporation. They do everything themselves. Thames Water in Oxford, where I used to live, even last year, their losses were 26%. Whereas the water bill of most countries are going up steadily in the Western world, he has managed to keep, last time he increased his prices, was 2000 so if Phnom Penh, my thesis is, if Phnom Penh can do it, why can't the others? It's not rocket science. Now you might say, you tell me five minutes before I should close. Okay. If Phnom Penh can do it, why can't Dhaka, Delhi, Mumbai, Cairo, Jakarta, cannot, why they can't do it? It's not technology. The other problem we have right now, again, is wastewater treatment. If you look at the international, all this writing, they, take, they say the world doesn't have sanitation. Most people, a lot of people do not have access to sanitation. When I proposed the International Water Supply and Sanitation Decade in 1976, and UN finally got it through the General Assembly resolution saying that should be the case, our concept of water supply was very simple. Water supply, a, a water that could be drunk from the tap without any health concern. Quality of water must be, it doesn't have to be the best, but it should be good enough so that you don't have to worry about your health. Sanitation, by sanitation we meant not the provision of a toilet alone, but there will be a sewer system that will take the wastewater to a wastewater treatment plant, treat the wastewater, and then discharge it in an environment friendly way. What's happening now with the sanitation? When the UN talks about sanitation, World Bank has come out the sanitation. Very simple. As long as you have a toilet in your house, and there is some sort of a sewer to take it out from your house, you have sanitation. It doesn't matter what happens to that wastewater. Delhi discharges its 99, these are official figures, 99.9% .9 of its wastewater without any treatment to the Valley Yamuna, as a result of which it's become an open sea. Mexico and Delhi now has 100%, almost 70, 80% sanitation, yes, because people have toilet and the wastewater is taken out. Nobody cares what happens to the wastewater. And that wastewater, after a while, becomes the input to drinking water for some other town downstream. Mexico City pumps all its wastewater to Mesquital Valley. And Mexico City claims we have sanitation. Untreated wastewater. What happens then? Mexico, of course, gets rid of it. Delhi gets rid of it. And this untreated wastewater is then used for agriculture. The farmers use it. In fact, there's a thriving business of fish grown in this wastewater dam. It's behind it. There's actually a dam to collect the wastewater. And that is sold all over. They are theoretically not supposed to sell. But if you grow a cabbage or a cauliflower in wastewater, a normal water, very difficult to say, unless they're sometimes so big, you ask your question, you know, they shouldn't be so big. Uh, with a normal water, the cabbage cannot be so big. I was in, recently in Vienna in the farmer's market. I saw a cauliflower over that big. I said, for sure somebody is using wastewater irrigation to grow that cabbage. And that was in Vienna. So this is the problem we're facing. We're playing down 
the problems are solved. And we in the academia are also to blame because we don't want to take people, the institutions, international organizations to task. We just repeat what they're saying without asking questions. Do this figure mean anything? And this is a problem with the area of water. We have many myths. One was, as I said, we don't have enough water. I say, that's a bunch of nonsense. We talk about waterborne diseases. And I'll give you one more example how the world is manipulating figures to show how things are doing better or not so good. It depends how you look at it. One of the waterborne diseases is cystosomiasis, which comes from a snail. Uh, we see that in North Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia. You go to the WHO website, and they will tell you that 200 million people are suffering from cystosomiasis. It's a debilitating disease. Temper, uh, tropical zone disease. These snails cannot survive in uh, temperate climate. Now, 200 million is a very nice figure, so anytime I now see an alarm figure, uh, alarm bells go in my head. I went and started looking in WHO statistics. What was the number of uh, people affected by cystosomiasis in the world in 2000? 200 million. Then I went to 1990. How many people were affected by cystosomiasis in 1990? 200 million. 1990, 1980, 1970, I went up to 1969. Remarkably good, 200 million. Remarkably constant, 200 million. So I was at a meeting with one of the previous director generals of Japanese director general of WHO. And I told him, I don't believe your figures. He was very upset. He said, Professor Beswast, you must believe WHO figures. I said, how can I believe your figure? And I gave this example. He said, you're absolutely right, but you must be wrong. We cannot, prove, we cannot give this type of rubbish. I said, I have consulted year by year in your library, because those days things were not online. From 1969 to up to 2009, after that I haven't bothered to check, 200 million people were constantly affected each year by cystosomiasis. So he called his vector control man. He said, tell Dr. Veswas, he's wrong, because this cannot be correct. The gentleman scratched his head, said, sir, he is correct. He said, how is it possible? How is it possible from 1969 to 2009, the number hasn't changed? Then he started thinking. He said, sir, there is an explanation. In some countries, the number goes down. Some countries, the number goes up. <laughs> and the total remains, there is a fluctuation country by country but the total remains the same. And I told the gentleman, Hespanov, I said, thank you very much for your explanation. Tell it to the Marines. I don't buy that. And so this is the problem in the water field. There are so many statistics that are now accepted as the truth, the global statistics. It is ridiculous. And if in academia we don't ask questions, if you ask questions, you pay a price. WMO made me persona non grata when I called them, when I told them the Leo plus 10 was a disaster in the water field, a disaster. 10 years later, the director general came and apologized. I said, that's okay. I, I don't give a damn. I'm not looking for your contract. I'm not looking for your uh, expert good rating. Uh, I'm not interested. I've got enough things to do. The moment you raise, raise this question, 
you, you pay a price. They don't call you. If you raise these questions, you tell UNESCO some of the figures they're using is a bunch of baloney. You are not in their favorite list anymore. And that is the price we pay. But I think if we, as academics we cannot question them, we are not doing our work. Now, just a few minutes to talk about your Water Institute. I'm glad University of Waterloo is doing a Water Institute. I had some discussions yesterday. I was very impressed with these young people they have doing a doctoral thesis. There are many areas they may agree or disagree with my views, but I was quite impressed by what, what they're doing, what they're doing. I would say I'll give a couple of pieces of advice to the Water Institute. One, and also to the professors here as well. One thing I have learned, our incentive system at the university is cockeyed. It doesn't matter whether it's the University of Waterloo, University, National University of Singapore, MIT, it really doesn't matter. We as professors get kudos if we publish in high impact journals. The impact factor is high. So if we publish something in water research, the highest impact factor in the water field, well, you are doing something good, good. You have, you have done that. When I look at it, how many people subscribe to water research in India and China? Well, three libraries do, do subscribe. Three libraries do subscribe to water research. China, six libraries subscribe to water research. I've stopped writing now for this high impact journal last three years. I only write now books and opinion pieces in the newspaper. It's amazing what an opinion piece in a newspaper do as long as it's an influential newspaper. In most countries, when the prime minister comes to his or her office, first thing they look at is a two-page summary put on their desk by their assistant what the newspapers have said about their performance, plus or minus. So when I take government of India, government of China to task, I know somebody's reading it. If I write in water research, maybe seven people all over the world will read it, it may have a high impact. But at one time, International Council of Scientific Union did, a stu did an estimate. I challenge you to see what is the average readership of a scientific paper. On an average, nine people read a scientific paper, including the author. So our incentive system is skewed. If you want the institute to be visible, publish by all means to keep your academic reputation in the high impact journal with maybe nine people will read it. But for heaven's sake, if you want to be known in Canada, if you want to work in India, if you want to work in China, a one opinion page in Globe and Mail will have more impact than 200 academic papers in the Canadian context. The rules of the game has changed. The blogs have, the blogs have overtaken the many, many of the things. So what I would suggest is pick up some topics where you could show some results, not in five years' time, but in two years' time. And what we need to make sure is during these two years, you produce something worthwhile that the world will sit up and take notice. 
and you must have a strategy on communication. There is so much noise these days, Bob, in the all over the world. One of the biggest problem is how do you get heard above the noise? So you have to somehow take the results of a research, not only from within the academic circle, but also outside the academic circle. And that's the only way you could establish. And I give you one example. David, sure yesterday, or was it yesterday, there was a listing of 10 research institutes in water. Number one and number two was from Singapore, National University of Singapore, Nanyang Technological University, NTU. The approach of NUS is completely different. Yesterday, when I went back to the room, all the professors and the people connected to the university, we get a, every day, we get a information from our, every week we get a information from our media people saying which professor was quoted where, what op-ed is this. So I found out there's a newspaper here which I never heard of, I think called Record or something. I, I can't remember what it is. Apparently, the university sent information about this talk to this local newspaper, whatever the name. I don't remember the name, for, forgive me for that. But I thought it was called Record or something, something similar. They picked it up. I found out by reading my, uh, the mail I got from the university that I am here, I am giving a talk, and the newspaper has said that. They do it systematically. Systematically. If you, it's the, I spent 17 years at Oxford, 17 or 18 years at Oxford. If I came here and gave a talk, university said, yeah, oh, you gave a talk, good. How was the weather? Yeah? <laughs> they couldn't care less. If I write an opinion page in the Times, nobody gives a damn. In Singapore, if I don't submit every three months what lectures I gave, what was that, where, when, what opinion pieces I wrote, did somebody invite me to come somewhere else to talk about anything? They chronologically record everything. At the end of the year, they send it to the rating agency, the Times Literary Supplement, one of those who uh, make this ranking. They gave, the, they flood them with data. So NUS now is number 20 univers, 20th university in the world, ranked 20th, because we have learned how to play the game. Sadly, University of Waterloo has not learned how to play the game. <laughs> Same thing you have to do. You have to learn, if you want to get to be recognized, I can tell you in the water field, if you can put together the expertise you have here, you, you would not have too much competition to be one of the top three or four. But you have to make a deliberate attempt to be included in, that in the listing, provide them with all the detailed information you want to do that. And the other thing is, you would need strong support from the management, top management of the university. If you don't get, if this institute does not get top support, strong support from the top management from the university, no matter how good you are, it will be an uphill battle to establish it internationally. The potential is there, how you go about it. The process in this case will be more important probably than the product. So you have to think, you're thinking about the product, and I applaud you for coming out with some good product and thinking about the product, but now the world has changed. So you have to think about the process as well. What is the process? And I will say, in the final analysis, probably the process will become more important than the product. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Bielak. Uh, I know that you've written extensively about uh, the water mega conferences and environmental mega conferences. Uh, I wonder if you'd like to comment a little bit about uh, what impact they've had. Well, the impact 
by writing the book, I met myself person and non grata with the organizers of the mega conferences. We did a survey of 3,000 people who came to the meetings, who did not come to the meeting to see what impact they had, these meetings had on them. Only 2.5% of the respondents said they had some positive impact. The others said, as far as they are concerned, whether the meeting took place or not is irrelevant. They give a good excuse and they call it mega conference, basically water tourism or environmental tourism. Said I had a chance to see Brazil, I had a chance to see Johannesburg, but did I use any of the information? Did I get knowledge which I didn't have before? No. So we did a detailed questionnaire for the policymakers from the different countries. It is depressing. But that doesn't mean uh, the last meeting in Rio, Rio Plus 20, the Washington Post editorial in Rio Plus 20 actually justified what we found out. He said if Rio Plus 20 showed us anything that this type of meeting should never be held again. And the cost, cost of the Rio meeting, we estimated, the original Rio in 1992, we estimated was over $200 million. So they are not cheap. They are expensive. So it gives a lot of people to go meet each other, do some private business, but if, does it help? The answer is overwhelmingly no. And this is not my view, this is what the people in general think. You mentioned the water crisis as a growth industry and sort of commented on the incredible amount of resources that goes into sort of quibbling over getting you know, the consensus of getting the calcul calculation data numbers right within the sort of climate of, of um, evidence-based policy. I was wondering if you could comment on alternative directions for pushing action to take place and how things, can, how things are prioritized. If, if, if the numbers are meaningless at such an aggregate scale, what is an alternative way of Getting the job done. Uh, having been advising at least 20 governments for a long time, including the government of Canada, and in my old age, I become a little cynical. Cynical in the sense, what I find, if what I recommend to a politician fits with his or her predetermined idea. They've already decided this is the direction you want to go, or they want to go. So if I recommend something in that direction, they will use that and say, look, here is a world famous expert says, and he cannot be wrong, and blah, blah, blah. So they use that to justify that. If it does not, it collects dust in the shell. So basically, it's a very, strange situations that my minister in Canada used to say, look, Dr. Beswas, my mind is made up. Don't confuse me with facts. Those are the direct quote. So, so I am a little cynical. Uh, only place I see the ministers listening to you very, very carefully is Singapore. And that is because the Singapore politicians, you don't become a politician because you want to be a politician. The party selects you rather than you selecting a party to be a politician. And the party will select you only if you are the uh, cream of the cream. The first question is, do you have access at the top level of government? Because the way the system works, there are so many filters. If, if you want to talk to a minister or the prime minister, there are so many filters. If you will write to him, him or her, there are so many filters through which your letter will go. 
And I learned it the hard way with the Indian Prime Minister. He asked me to send me a two-page note. And he said, I'll do it. And I said, I'll do it. As soon as I go back, I'll do that. Then he called his personal assistant and he said, when that note comes, I want it straight on my desk. I don't want any filtering. I don't want any comments. I want his note. Then after his assistant left, he said, if I had not given him very strict instruction, what will happen is, first they will decide whether it is important or not. They will decide. If they decide it is important, they won't send it to the Prime Minister, they'll send out the various ministry that has something to do with water, asking what they think will be, are my suggestions. And the Prime Minister told me, six months time, I'll get you two page, along with 100 pages of comments on what you wrote. And six months time, I have to be honest with you, I've forgotten what we discussed. So this is a problem, access, the first thing is, you must have access. If you don't have access, it is a very complicated process to talk to the people, get to the people to know you. The second item I learned, one of my mentors in 1973, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India. I asked her, I, I were talking about water, and she said, look, as a Prime Minister, I have absolutely no interest in water, absolutely none. And it floored me, it floored me completely. I thought the sun rose and set with water, and here is a Prime Minister, and water is life, blah, 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 and here is a Prime Minister who says, water is irrelevant, she doesn't want to discuss water. She said, if you want to discuss water, go to the Central Water Commission, they deal with water, they'll talk to with you the, with the technical part, and she said, her assistant will set up the meetings, I could talk. But I knew her well, I said, look, Water is important. He said, water, as someone said during this meeting, uh, the panel discussion, water is means to an end. It's not an end by itself. <coughs> if you want to <coughs> tell me how we should use water so that it creates job, it cr creates economic development, it improves the quality of life, it reduces poverty. How I can do that through water, I'm interested. But water management, I have, as a Prime Minister, I have to tell you I have no interest. And I learned from there that if you want to get a message, even to the, if, you, if I go, go to your president, I, I don't know the, who is CEO of ACE, uh, Waterloo's president, I, I have no idea. If you go and tell him, Chances are, I, 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 since I don't know, I'm just hypothesizing, that we have a water institute and this must get priority. He might make some polite noises, but if you frame in a such a way that water institute has the potential to make University of Waterloo go up 20 places in the ranking, he would listen. So the message you want to give has to be what is important to them, not what is important to you. That is what I learned from Mrs. Gandhi. And I've been always following that. Why is it I'm the, one of the very few water experts, perhaps the only water expert, who moves in the, politi moves in the political circle? I don't talk to them water, talk to them about water. But I talk to them through water, what changes they could make which will get them elected. So that is, why, when you talk to a politician, you could see what's going on in their mind. How did it help me, my next election, for myself or my party? So if you phrase it in such a way that it is of interest to that person and that, then the political person, you'll get somewhere. But if you just want to talk about the technicalities, unless that person happened to be a water person, you won't go, go very far. So that will be my advice. Give the information the way they understand it and they think it is important. Thank you very much for your very insightful talk. I work in the area of energy. I'd like to ask your opinion 
on the relationship between water and energy. Right now, renewable energy, and of course in North America, we have the oil sands, we're using fracking, you know, to extract the oil, uh, gas and oil from in, in US. So there is uh, interesting um, conflict or more demand on the water than before now. That is very true. In fact, I would argue oil industry is actually water industry with oil as a byproduct. That's what they told me too, yes. <laughs> I agree with Because for every barrel of every barrel of oil you take out from the ground in the best oil field, I advise also the CEO of Shell, for the best oil field, we have to pump eight gallons, eight barrels of water to get out one barrel of oil. For a mature oil field, it goes 18 to 20 barrels of water to get one barrel of oil out. If you look at the countries, electricity demands are going up. Energy demands are going up. China is now constructing one thermal power station every day, somewhere in China, one every day. India's energy needs are going up 8% a year compounded. Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, the same. Very simple question. Do you have one country in the world which has an energy policy that considers water or a water policy that considers energy? None. None, I can tell you. Canada doesn't have, US doesn't have, no country has this. And yet, last 500 years, we've been going on the basis of reductionism. If the problem becomes too big, we are reducing it and then trying to handle that. And now we are finding out water, food, energy, environment, employment generation, poverty elevations, they're all closely interlinked. How do we handle that? Our institutions are not set up like that. Universities, as an academic, I have to tell you, we are the most conservative people in the world. In the water field, we sit in watertight compartments and then we preach integration. <laughs> so we have to change our mindset and I think we have to start with ourselves. How do you get to talk? We have tr I have tried in many, many places, trying, we talk about the interdisciplinary, except in a few odd cases, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't last very long. It becomes on a personal relationship. Say if I have a good relation with Bruce or Ed, we, we have three of us or four of us, we could work out. Uh, if you are from a different discipline, we trust each other, we work out. But we, cannot, we, have, been, we have failed singularly to institutionalize this multidisciplinary. We talk about it all the time. But sadly, we have not. UN sends multidisciplinary groups to look at the problem. I've been to, I've led many of those. Multidisciplinary team means the team has an engineer, an economist, a sociologist, a political scientist, a lawyer or whatever it is, you decide a veterinary person or something. Six people go to the field, six people write six individual chapters, then we put it together and it's a multidisciplinary report. That is the problem. Again, we are playing games with semantics and, and we got to talk straight. There's no point saying everything is working well, everything is hunky-dory when things are not working. But I fully agree with you. You cannot produce water with a great deal of energy. Countries like India, China, Mexico, about 20 to, in case of Mexico, 35% of the electricity is accounted for the water sector, 35% of the whole. In India, China, it's between 20 to 25%. So we need a tremendous amount of electricity just to run our water sector. And the same, we need a tremendous amount of energy to run our, uh, tremendous amount of water to run the energy sector. But we, the institutions don't talk to each other. Policies don't, they don't coordinate the policies. And that is the problem we're facing. We know what to do, but we don't know how to do it. Very rarely. What people do, finally, what happens. Because in most countries, 
the government cannot dictate what people should do. And in any case, in many countries, they don't have the right to dictate. What, like in U US or a few other, what is below your ground is yours. In the municipality, let's say in Canada, for example, mm -hmm. in the Waterloo region, mm -hmm. would that be the municipality or the regional government that would make that decision? I presume the municipalities make that decision, but the regional government has a say. Okay. Uh, it again depends in the countries. In, for example, in Mexico, the central government is responsible. So even if you're a state or a province, you have no say. The central government will tell you, you have to do this, this, and that, because water is a central, central responsibility. In countries like what we call federated states, Canada, India, US, it's a state responsibility. So it's a playoff between the, how much autonomy the states wanted to give the municipalities.